Thanks very much, Chris Neff, for filling us in on what the nets are really about in New South Wales. Uh, obviously, a really interesting and enlightening look at the history of those nets. What we haven't really covered so far is why does any of this matter? So, so obviously in this room there's a lot of people I've seen who really love sharks, and I'm sure there's people here who don't really like sharks, who don't want to be in the water with sharks, um, and wouldn't mind if all the sharks were wiped out. So the next person we want to have up is um, Dr. Dave Booth, and he's a marine ecologist, so he looks at sharks' roles in those ecosystems, and he's going to tell us a little bit about those sharks and why it even matters if we have sharks at all. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm a marine fish ecologist, so I'm not a, probably a bona fide shark biologist, so I will end up my very short talk uh, talking about some of the research we're doing with people like Bob's department, the DPI and CSIRO, and in case I forget to say it, a little plug for research. Um, certainly Australia is a world leader in, in, in shark research, and uh, you know the fact that we still need to know a lot more suggests they're very complex animals. Um, and so I wanted to, if I can find my little talk, Remember how to use PC. Here we go. Right. Okay, so I was asked to talk about the role of sharks in ocean ecosystems. Now, um, so what I want to briefly mention, and this will be uh, a review for many of you, is um, shark biodiversity and their roles and their roles in ecosystems in the ocean. Then a little bit about the specific uh, role of some of the big nasty sharks we were all very afraid of in the ecosystem and the importance of them as apex predators and uh, luckily for us we've had a lovely removal experiment going worldwide and uh, removing sharks through fishing, you have to remember that's the main way sharks are probably removed from the ocean, um, has allowed scientists to get a bit of a handle on what happens when you take sharks away and it's a bit horrifying. And uh, finally, if I get any time, just a bit about the stuff we're, we're doing. Ooh, I've not got so we'll, we'll jump. I'm sure you can all read that, but the basic idea, there's only about 400 or so species of shark, there's 25,000 species of fish, a tiny fraction, but boy do they punch above their weight for public interest and also ecology. So the different groups of sharks, are, uh, some of them are shown here, nice little pictures, and as you can see the biodiversity or species richness changes, uh, is quite different among the different types. And the main point I want to make is uh, that's a shark, that's, no, that's not a very big hand, that's one of the very smaller sharks. There's another one, and uh, there are a few more there. Now, so the, the point there, um, very briefly, is that the sharks are very biodiverse. There's a lot of different sizes. They fit into a lot of different parts of food webs in the ocean. And a shark is not as a shark is not as a shark. So we really concentrate on the bikies, I suppose, but they really have a lot of other, other features. Most of them are carnivores, but, but the, the whale sharks are carnivore of a different kind, and it's plankton. Um, so, just quickly about global declines in sharks, and it has been quite horrific um, when, when the data have come in. And uh, just, just simply a contour map of threatened species uh, shows you where a lot of the action is. In Southeast Asia, our doorstep, the northern shores of Australia, um, saw sharks and things like that. We are, we are not responsible, we're, we're Johnny on the spot for some of the most major shark declines that have occurred. Um, I saw this interesting one, it was uh, a genetic study done on the contents of shark fin soup in the US and just to try and horrify um, those New Yorkers that eat shark fin soup about the range, the biodiversity of their soup I suppose you could say, containing a number of threatened species. Um, we always point the finger overseas, overfishing over there. Now for a, for a small population in a big country we're punching above our weight in removals of some species. These are recent data from a, from a report. And the school shark is uh, a very big fishery um, in Australia and it's currently rated overfished by this very conservative group that would rather say it wasn't. So, so when you see figures like that, you know things are really dying out. It doesn't tell the whole picture because we don't really know what the effort is there. Um, but certainly it suggests that the sharks are under threat from humans in Australia as well. Um, another one here. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Sharks as threatened apex predators, that's a double whammy. First of all, they are apex predators, and secondly, they're threatened, and hence our removal experiment I mentioned earlier. I'll just quote this classic paper from Randolph Myers and others, uh, which uh, looked at some long-term data on the big, the big 10 or the big 11 sharks, some of them are shown here, and their declines through, through the last 20 years. And all of them suffered serious declines, apparently at the hands of overfishing. Tiny, tiny little figures here, but hopefully you can see the top row are all going down and the, and the middle row are all going up. They're the mesopredators. A lot of them are sharks and rays. These are things 
potentially kept in check by those predators. And uh, by the predators being removed, they may be released. These apex predators may, re may their removal may release the meso predators, which can do whatever they do to the next level of the food chain. There's one example. You see something on the third row here. That's uh, that's the next level down. They're bay scallops. They're, they're scallops that live along the eastern seaboard of the U.S., especially in this lovely, amazing estuarine habitat called Chesapeake Bay, and they're a major fishery. And to cut a, a long story very, very short, um, this interesting figure shows us a classic ecological case of indirect effects. This is the cow nose ray here, and it's, it's uh, snuffling up some lovely uh, scallops uh, in Chesapeake Bay. The top thing shows us the decline in large fishes through time. In the middle, we see the, the bounce back of these cow nose rays, which are always there, but were kept in check. Um, and then the consequences to the, to the base, very valuable base scallop fishery. So I always like to see when one of these things affects industry, governments listen when industry is affected, uh, whether it's tourism, whether it's, whether it's uh, harvesting of, of seafood. And so this is a very, very good example where we have an indirect effect of the sharks, uh, a removal experiment, thank you very much fishermen for doing that bit of science for us, and a clear demonstration that that top apex predator can indirectly affect things down lower to our personal detriment. So, um, just very briefly, uh, our research, we have a number of uh, people within our group uh, collaborating with, with various people around the world, particularly locally with DPI and also with, with CSIRO. Uh, we've been interested in uh, uh, various life history things of small and large lasmobranchs. Uh, I'll talk to you particularly about the white shark work, just uh, a couple of slides of that, um, and here we go. So, one of the things, uh, Bob showed uh, some nice pictures of uh, vertebrae of sharks and how we can age them. Now, that's a very useful thing because you can tell all sorts of things like growth rate and maximum longevity. You can compare populations and look one that's doing better or whatever. One of the problems with white sharks is it just doesn't work that well. Once you slice the vertebrae, there's nothing to see. So we uh, collaborated with uh, uh, DPI, CSIRO, and also ENSTO, I believe it or not, the nuclear, nuclear facility, to use some fancy uh, technology to get some really good uh, cutaways of these shark vertebrae to enable us to develop uh, growth models. And so it's really exciting for an ecologist when they get to go indoors and put on a lab coat. Um, apart from some lovely artwork that came out of this, um, we were able to develop some growth groups for white sharks around Australia with one of the largest collections of vertebrae, over 120 vertebrae collected from, from animals that have been captured through the years. And so we're starting to analyse differences between males and females, white sharks out east and west and that sort of thing, using this indirect uh, technology. Um, we also, uh, in that same particular project, uh, sort of used our work to back up some work done by Cyro and another UCS colleague looking at the movement of juvenile white sharks from Point Inlet in Victoria all the way up to Port Stephens. And that was an unknown until some shark fishers were spotted catching these guys off uh, Stockton Beach. And I think it was a 60 minutes uh, story. In any case, very interesting phenomenon um, which has been verified by some fish tagging and other things. But, um, and here's my colleague doing his uh, helicopter counts of sharks interesting project. And you can see the red arrow up on the top right indicating that, that uh, migration of these sharks annually, I think it is. And so we were able to use the vertebrae of sharks caught in this area um, to look at the chemical signature on them. And the little, you can see here through, this is time if you will. Uh, these are about annually, those little pulses, in this case in, in, in arsenic. And they indicate the animal we think moving through and around the Hunter River, which is a, 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 an estuary very with a lot of uh, human um, metal sort of uh, signatures. So this sort of um, uh, technology has helped verify some of the work of that as well. Um, my student uh, worked with uh, uh, Rodney Fox's uh, shark people down in South Australia, did her PhD thesis there. One of the aspects of that, and a big question at the time, was whether these tourist boats are actually conditioning the sharks to come in for bait. Um, there was a great assumption they were. So through her tagging and recaptures uh, on that tourist boat over many years, she was able to verify that almost that, that wasn't the case. So we see most sharks only come once, except for that you might notice a little tiny blob out to the other side. Uh, Johnny, Johnny the shark was very, was very tame when it come back. So there's a bit of an indication that bait conditioning might happen. But for the most part, these sharks come and, and leave and head off to hunt seals or whatever. Um, so the tourist boats are probably not a great impact on the, on the threat to humans. And, and uh, that's all I wanted to say, actually. So just to have you appreciate that the sharks are out there. There's big ones and little ones. The big ones especially are apex predators, and you remove them to your own detriment.
around today.